and welcome to Hively Avenue Mennonite Church. I feel like not everybody's here yet, but we need to start. It's 9.30. So you'll notice you're sitting a little different today than usual, and that is Tim's fault. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. I think it's a good idea, actually except we should have coffee around the table. <laughs> Few more people coming. So we come here on this rather cool Sunday morning, as God's people, seeking God's face together, we come seeking God's grace and presence. We come as we are, exactly as we are, no matter where we have been this week or in the midst of whatever is going on in our lives, we come as we are. For our call to worship, I have chosen the breath of God on the dawn. I invite you as I read to repeat the phrase, come and worship the Lord. So let's begin. You don't have it in your bulletin, but you need to listen. Come, you who are weary from the darkness of the night, come and worship the Lord. Come and worship. Come with your gratitude for the blessings of the day. Come with your pleadings for mercy and release. Come and worship the Lord. Come and worship the Lord. For the Lord our God is gathering us in, and Jesus Christ is our host. Let us welcome the spirit that welcomes us here. Come and worship the Lord. Come and worship the Lord. Let's pray. Loving God, 
just like the disciples on the Emmaus Road. We yearn for your presence. And often we too don't recognize you when you show up. Help us this morning. Give us open eyes, ears, and hearts to be aware, to know that you are here. Bless us all together as we seek to worship you in the merciful name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, I forgot to mention that um, our theme this morning, you probably have seen that from where the, the sermon comes from. It's on the Emmaus story, or the Emmaus road. And it'll become a little more clear to you as we go through our service this morning about Jesus showing up and what that means to us. So, Hillary, would you come and lead us? Good morning. I invite us to stand for our opening songs, and we'll start with number 129, O Worship Our God. to number 499, In the Morning When I Rise.
every Sunday morning we light the peace candle as a reminder of our own commitment to peacemaking. This week has been another one of those really painful days hearing the news about war making, violence, bloodshed, children being gunned down in schools. It's hard to know what, how to be positive about peacemaking. There's so much need. Let me share part of a prayer from Flames of the Spirit. God of peace, may we see the day when war and bloodshed cease, when a great peace will embrace the world, when nation will not threaten nation, and humankind will not again make war. Compassionate God, Fulfill the promise conveyed in scripture. I will bring peace to the land, and you shall lie down, and no one shall terrify you. I will rid the land of vicious beasts, and it shall not be ravaged by war. Let love and justice flow like a mighty stream. Let peace fill the earth as the waters fill the sea. Amen. Please join me as I light the peace candle. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are all. I'd like for you to, around your tables, pass the peace to each other. Now you do this the way you're comfortable. If you, if you don't want to touch, that's fine. But let's give peace to each other in whatever way feels comfortable. Like, peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. be with all of you. Coming to our confession, we'll do this a little bit differently this morning. I, I think in your bulletin it says uh, confession with silent contemplation, and then I realized later contemplation is usually silent, right? <laughs> so anyway, it's a prayer without words. I don't know how many of you pray without words. But one friend of mine told me, she always prays without words. She prays for others just by thinking of them. That's a different way of praying, isn't it? But let's see if we can do that this morning. In our confession time, I would invite you to a few moments of silent contemplation. This is the season when we try to coax beautiful things from the garden, like the seeds who need the sun and the rain and silence and darkness to sprout. We too need silence to grow. God nourishes and comforts us during these times. I invite you now to a brief moment 
a wordless, silent prayer. As you close your eyes, become aware of being in God's presence. Hear these words from Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. Are there children? Are there people who would like to pretend they're children? It's Sue Ann who has a story for you. Oh, I see some over there. Morning. <laughs> oh, okay. So, not Nella. You've been on a long trip. Sixteen hours in the airplane. It's a long time. So, you got to see a brother and a sister. You haven't seen them for a long time. And Rolene, how are you? Good. Forrest and Everett. Okay, I want you to pretend like your your disciples, Jesus' disciples, but you don't know that he has risen. You some of you have been to the tomb and Jesus' body wasn't there. But you're kind of sad. And so I'm going to tell you a story from Luke this morning about two disciples. These two disciples would be your friends because you're disciples too. So these two disciples had had a really difficult time because Jesus had died and that was the person they were following. And now that their leader was gone, they were really sad. And these two disciples decided they were going to walk to the town of Emmaus. I don't know if they lived there or what, why they chose to walk there, but they, it was seven miles from Jerusalem where everyone, else, where everyone else was. And so they were walking along the road and they were talking about what had been happening with Jesus. And then all of a sudden... Jesus appears, but they don't know. They don't know that it's Jesus. And Jesus says to them, what are you talking about as you're walking along the road? And they said, well, haven't you been in Jerusalem? Don't you know of all the things that have happened? That our Jesus of Nazareth was turned over and crucified and died? And that some of our friends said his body had been stolen out of, out of the tomb. 
And, and you, where have you been that you don't know this? Well, the stranger who was Jesus, but they still didn't know that. He started talking to them about all of the things in the Old Testament that said there was going to be a Messiah, that there was going to be a Jesus that was going to come and talk about how your life could be fuller and you could have eternal life. And he just kept talking to them as they walked along, and it looks like they were listening to what Jesus had to say. Well, they got to Emmaus, and Jesus walked on. But they said, wait, 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 wait. Don't go. It's, it's dark. You might as well come and eat dinner with us. And so they went inside, and there probably was somebody in there who they knew who had cooked dinner. And they sat down to eat, to eat dinner. And when Jesus took the bread and he broke it, all of a sudden, they knew it was Jesus. And then Jesus disappeared. And they couldn't believe that they had seen Jesus. They had walked with Jesus, but they didn't recognize Jesus. They didn't know that it was Jesus. And they were so excited that they turned around right away and went back to Jerusalem to tell all the disciples that they had seen Jesus. So why, why do you think they didn't recognize Jesus? I don't know either. I don't know if he looked different, if they really hadn't seen him a lot. And they were followers, but they hadn't seen him a lot. We don't know why they didn't recognize Jesus. But do you know, do you know that Jesus is with us every day? Jesus is with us whether we're riding our bicycle, whether we're doing our homework, whether we're sitting in school. Jesus is always present, but it's not that we think about it all the time. It's not that we think about it all the time, but Jesus is always present with us. The spirit of Jesus is always here. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending us Jesus to show us the way to live. Help us to look for Jesus every day when we are playing, doing our homework, whether we're happy or sad, Jesus is there, but we need to look for Jesus. Thank you for these precious, precious children. We're so glad that they are here at church with us. Amen. Thank you. The music group is suggesting that maybe we just sing two songs in a row. So we had missed one. Let's start by singing number 345, our song of the month. And then after that, we'll sing uh, Open the Eyes of My Heart. So I invite us to stand for both of these if we're able. And let's start with 345.
And let's continue singing uh, with number 401. Open the eyes of my heart, 401. And we will sing verse, verse, refrain, coda. And then that same thing again, verse, verse, refrain, coda. Let's sing together. Louise Clausen to help me with the reading of our text. It is Luke 24, 13 to 17, and 27 to 32. I will read first. Now, on that same day, and I was thinking, okay, which day was that? Does anybody know? On that same day that Jesus was resurrected, at least I think that's what it was. It says on the same day, first day of the week. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed 
and broke it. And he vanished. Oh, and they recognized, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? The word of the Lord. Noch am gleichen Tage gingen zwei Jüngern nach einem Dorf namens Emmaus, das etwa zwei Stunden von Jerusalem entfernt lag. Unterwegs redeten sie natürlich von allem, was sich zugetragen hatte. Während sie sich noch so miteinander unterhielten, trat auf einmal Jesus selbst zu ihnen und ging mit ihnen. Aber ihre Augen waren wie gehalten, sie erkannten ihn nicht. Er fragte sie, worüber redet ihr denn so eifrig? Da blieben sie traurig stehen. Dann begann er ihnen das klarzulegen, was in den Schriften über ihn geschrieben stand. Er fing mit Mose an und ging alle Propheten durch. So kamen sie dem Dorf näher. Er wollte aber weitergehen. Sie aber baten ihm dringend, Herr, bleibe doch bei uns. Es wird Abend und der Tag geht zur Neige. Da trat er bei ihnen ein und blieb. Während sie dann so zu Tisch saßen, nahm er das Brot, sprach die Danksagung, brach es und gab es ihnen. Da wurden ihre Augen geöffnet und sie erkannten ihn, aber schon war er ihnen entschwunden. Da sagten sie zueinander, brannte nicht unser Herz in uns, als er unterwegs mit uns redete und uns den Sinn der Heiligen Schrift erschloss? Tim, God bless you as you share with us. Well, first of all, I got permission this morning to announce something, which is that yesterday morning at 10.20 a.m., uh, Shabnam Pratik and Shanice welcomed a baby boy. <laughs> There's... There's not a name yet, at least that they've told me. And um, he was born at 10, yeah, I said that, 1020. And I think it was seven pounds and 10 ounces, so I may not have the ounces right. So if you won the pool, um, the check is in the mail. <laughs> Catholic theologian John Shea has described the Christian faith as being about going out gathering the people, breaking bread, telling the stories, and continuing to repeat that sequence. This sequence happens in today's gospel text and really in many other biblical texts in some way also, but I particularly like this one. Go out. Both Jesus and the unsuspecting disciples were out and about. Gather the people, or we might say join the people, Because which of today's characters gathered the group? And when did the gathering begin? When it was just the two? When Jesus joined? When did the gathering start? While they were on the road? Not until they gathered and broke bread? Sometimes we institute the gathering. Sometimes we need to join with others in their context, with them taking the lead. Hospitality includes both being gracious host and gracious guest. And I feel that's one of the biggest things the church needs to learn. We tend to want to bring people here because we want them to be part of us. But we need to also learn to go out and be part of them where they are, whoever that, whoever that person or them happens to be. And it often also means learning to ask questions, 
good questions of what is it you're talking about? What are you discussing? What's going on in your life? What are you thinking about? I find the older I get, the more I want to learn to ask good questions. It was one of the things I was envious of Jake about periodically. I felt like he was really good at asking good questions. I tried to learn from him. Shea also once said that sometimes we tell the stories, then break the bread, and sometimes we break the bread and then tell the stories, and most often they are simply intertwined. So, just so you know, you've got some things that you're table today, and you can feel free to partake in those now. And the table back there, you've got two of everything. That's because you can share that now with the, with the children if you want to, too. Why break the bread and drink together? Because Jesus said to, or because it is such a human and humanizing activity that we will do it? And so I'm becoming aware of God's presence in our stories and our breaking of bread, we make the ordinary sacred. This is, I believe, how the disciples in today's story came to recognize Jesus. They didn't recognize him because they didn't expect it to be him. They thought he was dead. But as their stories came together, and as they let go of all they'd been holding inside of them, and then finally as he broke bread with them, something he had done with them many times, including the night before he was arrested, they recognized him. I'll insert one little note. The one bowl, the one reason one bowl of crackers is separate is because those are gluten-free. And so if somebody needs gluten-free, they, uh, they can have those. Others of you can have them too. But. So why do we tell stories? What's the part of telling stories? They connect us. And when we also connect them with our experience of God, something bigger takes place. We recognize Jesus. We recognize God in new ways. But often we have to do some letting go. We have to go outside our com comfort zone to join with others. We have to take the risk of joining with others and of gathering. And we have to take the risk of telling our stories and breaking bread. The symbols that we have in front of us today, they're kind of like communion, but I didn't want to make it officially communion because I want you just to be able to do this while we're eating and while you're sharing your stories together. There's a parable about a peasant from Crete, which Virgil and Louise, you've spent some serious time in Crete. There was a, he told the story of a peasant in Crete who deeply loved his life. He enjoyed tilling the soil, feeling the warm sun on his back as he worked the fields, and feeling the soil under his feet. He loved the planting, the harvesting, and the very smell of nature. He loved his wife and his family and his friends. He enjoyed being with them, eating together, drinking, talking, making love. And he loved especially Crete his tiny, beautiful country. The earth, the sky, the sea, it was his. This was his home. One day he sensed that death was near. What he feared was not what was beyond, for he knew God's goodness and grace and had lived a good life. No, he feared leaving Crete, his wife, his children, his friends, his home, and his land. Thus, as he prepared to die, he grasped in his right hand a few grams of soil from his beloved Crete, and he told his loved ones to bury him with it. And he died. And he woke and found himself at heaven's gates, the soil still in his hand, and heaven's gate firmly barred against him. Eventually, St. Peter emerged through the gates and spoke to him. You've lived a good life, and we have a place for you inside but you cannot enter unless you drop that handful of soil. You cannot enter as you are now. The man was reluctant to drop the soil and protested, why? Why must I let go of this soil? Indeed, I cannot. What's inside those gates I have no knowledge of, but this soil I know. 
It's my life, my work, my wife, my kids. It's what I know and love. It's Crete. Why should I let it go for something I know nothing about? Peter answered, when you get to heaven, you will know why. It's too difficult to explain. I am asking you to trust. Trust that God can give you something better than a few grains of soil. But the man refused. In the end, silent and seemingly defeated, Peter left him, closing the large gates behind. Several minutes later, the gates opened a second time, and this time from them emerged a young child. She did not try to coax the man into letting go of the soil in his hand. She simply took his hand, and as she did, it opened, and the soil of Crete spilled to the ground. She then led him through the gates, and a shock awaited him. As he entered heaven, there before him lay all of Crete. The story needs on one hand to stand on its own. There are many learnings and reflections we could make. But one might be that when, let, when we let go of what we hold so tightly and share our stories, especially in the context of breaking bread, a whole new land of community opens up to us and feels very much like home and sometimes even home on a grander scale or in a new way. So I'd like to, uh, us to understand this both as communion and not communion. Not trying to make it official, because we have some different ideas probably on how it should be done when it is official and who can participate, but today everyone can participate. We're gathering the people, breaking the bread, and I'm going to give you a chance to tell the stories. And in that, I believe Jesus Christ will show up. Crackers and cents represent Christ's body and all the sharing of bread that Jesus did with his disciples and that we continue to do together. The grapes with their juiciness and redness may represent Christ's blood, but it also represents life and what we need for life to flow through us. It represents our commonality. So tell your stories at your table about where you've seen God this week. Where did Jesus show up? It might be something very small. It might be something very unexpected. Be a little careful about your time so that others can also share. And share the bread and grapes and drink water together as you share living stories of where you've seen God this past week. When you've finished, if there is a biblical story or two that feels like your stories connect with, think about those as well. And I'll conclude the time in... Well, that one says, now we're going to go at least 10 to 15 minutes, okay? We're going to go at least 15 minutes. So I will close the time when we get to the end of it, and then we will conclude our worship service from there. So take time at your tables to share your stories. <laughs> 